right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 425 Show. I'm your host, Nicole Mangina, with Windermere Real Estate. Each week, we talk to different people who live in the 425 and find out what makes living here so interesting, part of which is the people and the cool experiences that we have, they've had. So uh, we've got a great guest for you today, but first, I want to do a little market update. You can see that in Facebook Live. Actually, can't see anything, but we'll have it on the blog after the show. Uh, NicoleMangina.com forward slash podcast. Last week, I had told you that they were releasing the uh, market sales data for the month from our MLS, and they came out with it. And let's see, east side prices are up 5% from last year. Last year, the average sales price was $845. Right now, it's $890. Um, and we have two and a half months supply of inventory. Um, and we've been used to, which is actually heading towards a balanced market. Balanced market is four to six months supply of inventory, which means if you took all of the homes that were on the market, you took the number of sales per month and you average it out, you know, how long would it take for all of that inventory to sell? That's what an absorption rate is and what gives us the month supply of inventory. So we've been at a month, which is exceptionally low. Uh, and drove all the prices up. Now we're at two and a half. We're headed towards that four to six range, um, which means buyers have more choices. They've got more time to make a decision. But it also means that for sellers, there's still stuff out there selling. Um, so that was the east side Seattle. They also do. That is up 2%. Last year, the average sales price was 735 Now it's 750 So there you go. Again, you can always go to NicoleMangina.com forward slash podcast after the show, and we'll have those charts there. For you to be able to take a look at everything but i want to chat with our guest today brian welcome brian how are you doing well thanks for having me yeah absolutely um God, we've known each other a long time mm -hmm. um i helped you guys with your first house and, and, your, and the second and house. the second house <laughs> Which and we're still in yeah exactly you've got two beautiful kids thanks, um, so I, do you. thank you i know <laughs> i love i love facebook we don't see each other face to face very often but i always get to see what you're up to and Saw the cute homecoming pictures with your oldest yeah. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. That was adorable. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what you love about the 425 at the very end. But um, you're, you're you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you are a big deal. <laughs> you're very modest about it. But, uh, you know, we just had Veterans Day. You are a vet. You did a couple tours in the Persian Gulf, correct? Mm -hmm. And Navy Search and Rescue. Correct. Uh, you posted some videos over the weekend of some of the stuff you did. That was amazing. Oh, thanks. That was impressive. And then uh, you decided maybe that wasn't enough in life, and you went out and climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's that's how it ended up. That, there you that go. That wasn't necessarily <laughs> the plan. No, <laughs> well, yeah, which I would imagine, right? <laughs> but uh, but it became something that you did, and mm -hmm. you wrote a book about it called Blind Descent. Again, we will have uh, the information for this on the um, website after the show because this is, it's a fantastic book. I totally recommend um, people reading it because it's about your experience. Um, climbing the mountain and summoning would have been interesting and a huge feat all on its own, but you had some really unique things happen to you when you were up there. Mm -hmm. So um, very cool. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, how, so how did your, how'd you get into this whole mountain climbing thing? Um, well, I mean, no one ever said I was smart. <laughs> I think you're pretty smart. <laughs> um, well, I think we're all wired differently. Right. And that's just how I'm wired. I grew up in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. like living in the mountains and just very adventurous. Yeah. You know, back in the 80s, we didn't have all the distractions of Facebook Live and right. <laughs> Hi. everything else that's going on with the, the devices. Yeah. So, you know, if good yeah, or bad weather, my parents were yourself. like, yeah, exactly. They're like, get outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just yeah. understanding, you know, growing up in that, that environment, you know, it it really shapes, you know, certain individuals differently. For and sure. For me, it was just, it was all about adventure. And mm -hmm. that's why I went in the military. I right. had opportunities to go to college right away, but mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go see the world, do something mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. You know, so I was jumping out of helicopters and, you know, doing that fun stuff in my early 20s. Right. Yeah. And like into the ocean, I think jumping out mm -hmm. onto land, like parachute, you know, parachuting, I think is crazy enough and then you went into the into the ocean right nice yeah, work. I was a rescue swimmer combat yeah. search and rescue so yeah two tours in the gulf um got out you know got married to joanna mm -hmm. and we we moved up here back in 2001 and i think i was missing something in my life mm -hmm. you know that that sense of adventure we were in grad school and you know just yeah. working and you know being responsible and stuff so <laughs> it's overrated <laughs> yeah i needed to <laughs> kind of sidestep that for a while and, uh -huh. um, you know, 
add some adventure in my life mm-hmm. and just started climbing here. There's, you know, no shortage of adventures just in our backyard, which is amazing. Right. Um, but stepped it up a little bit, decided mm-hmm. to climb the highest peaks on the seven continents, mm-hmm. Everest being one of them. Sure. And there you have it. Wow. Okay. That's cool. And do you have, did you have people here that kind of got you into that or <clears throat> it just was something you um, just started doing it and deciding? Yeah, I think this is, the, there was, this is my thing. Yeah. I had some friends that I was climbing with, but mm-hmm. that's a, that's a tough goal to really lock it down to like one, one or two friends right. because we all have busy lives. And yeah, so it, I really had to own it personally. Mm-hmm. Otherwise I would have been putting my success on someone else. Right. So and that, that can be tough in life. For, yeah. That, that's like a tweetable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even on Twitter, but it feels like something that that's a big thing. Cause you're right. It's really about owning your stuff. Um, well, let's talk about this whole, uh, so what are the seven peaks, by the way? Seven. I know there's Kilimanjaro. Yep, that's in Africa. So Elbrus, which is in <laughs> Russia, it's okay. highest peak in Europe. Okay. Everest, okay. highest peak in Asia and the mm-hmm. world. Aconcagua, which is in South America. Okay. Denali, which is North America, up in okay. Alaska. And I have not summited Denali. Okay. So I've been on it three times, snowboarded it once, uh-huh. but made good decisions to turn around when it was kind of life or death. And, yeah. You know, so. It might be one of those things that eludes me my whole life, and mm-hmm. that's a lesson in itself, just being okay with that. Right, I bet. Because you can just keep just going after something, and does it really matter? Yeah. You know, so that's totally, that'll be a, another podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I am okay. Yeah. Um, and down in Antarctica, it's Vincent Massif. Okay. And then Kosciuszko in Australia, which the whole family went and did with me. Oh, really? That is awesome. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, it's like 7,000 feet, like five miles. But Okay. Yeah, it was cool. It's a respectable hike for sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and when you did um, Everest back in 2011, you said. Yep. Right? So tell us a little bit about what that was, what that was all about, right? I, you know, I read the book and then, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah. No, Everest, it's a legit hike for mm-hmm. sure. At 29,035 feet. Yeah. It's, you know, the highest mountain in the world, but there's only a third of the air up there. So if you were to pluck your body from here in the studio, mm-hmm. put you on the top, you'd pass out and die. Yeah. <laughs> so it takes a month just to acclimate. Right. And base camp alone is actually 3,000 feet higher than Rainier. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So 38 miles on foot. Wow. And, yeah, just getting to base camp is quite an accomplishment. And then from there, it's, it's hiking up and down the mountain. So you have to acclimate. So what that does is it forces your body into oxygen-deprived areas, which your body will then produce more red blood cells, which mm-hmm. carry oxygen, so you can survive higher. So right. it's, a, it's a long process, super boring at times, lots of downtime. If you have a great family at home, it's it, it's a mental game. It's like, what the heck am I doing here? Yeah, I bet. You know, day over day. But it's you got to find that one reason just to keep keep going because you, know, you can give up on goals all the time, but then that will define who you are. Right. On the flip side, if you get summit fever and, you know, you can die if you're not making good decisions. So mm-hmm. it is that balance in life. Um, but, yeah, so after a month of being there, I was fully acclimated. Mm-hmm. I climbed another few peaks in the Himalayas in that time and, you know, had a summit window. Mm-hmm. Went for it. Um, it. Takes about five days from base camp to actually get in a position up higher on the mountain to then go for the summit. Okay. And there's only a few summit windows per year just because it's so high up there it's in the jet stream the the weather's just really really horrible so usually there's a lot of people that are in position to actually go for the summit i was in a unique position where i was wedged right between people that were trying to summit the day prior Mm -hmm. which get 70 mile an hour winds so they were pushed back oh wow and then the day i went up is like 50 mile an hour winds later in the day Mm -hmm. so people were waiting for the next day so I actually, just myself and a song, Sherpa, mm-hmm. the two of us, were the only two attempting the summit from either side. Which oh, wow. Very unique. Like, it just never happens. That just two of you go up at a mm-hmm. time? Because it's the whole safety in numbers mm-hmm. thing, I would imagine. Well, and, extent, and, and it's know? about that weather window. So people are trying to, to really wedge it in mm-hmm. those weather windows. I just happen to get, get my own weather window. Got it. Because yeah. that was kind of your assigned day and it just, everything lined up? Or? Yeah. yeah okay. Pretty much. Yeah, so we're we're heading up, and um, you know, you go through the night, you climb through the night because when the sun comes up, things become unstable mm-hmm. because heat doesn't work well for metal conductors. You know, the anchors that are holding ropes to the mm-hmm. 
to the mountain that are fixed lines that I'm attached to as a climber. Mm -hmm. um, so all through the night, um, about midnight or so, Pasong was getting sick, and we had a conversation at 28,000 feet. Uh, he decided he was going to head back down, mm -hmm. and I was going to continue up. So it was kind of the, one of those moments where you, you, you only have the information, you know, within three feet of you, within arm's reach. So you make these decisions that you can live and die by. Yeah, I was wondering about that because once you're up there, it's not like you have, it's like you don't really know where the weather's going once you're up there, right? You have to hope for kind of the best based on the decision you made. Yeah. You know, yeah, a couple it, hours prior. And even prior, we didn't we didn't go for the summit until we knew what the predicted weather was. So we Got it. Radio down. They triangulated it to like Sweden and Seattle, and we came back like. Oh wow. Well. Okay. Yeah. So there's a system in place, but when you're on the mountain, it's. How am I doing? How's Pasong doing? Mm -hmm. You know, are we are we safe? He was actually going to wait where we were. Mm -hmm. I was going to go up, come back down, and we were going to go down together. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out so well. Yeah. You know, it's the death zone. There's, you know, 26,000 feet and above. Like, if you cut your finger, it won't heal. There's just oh, not, wow. enough, there's not enough air to survive up there for long. So he wasn't feeling good. He made a decision. He went back to Got it. Did he just camp. have, like, the flu or something? Or altitude sickness? Or altitude who knows? sickness. Got it. Yeah. So, so even Sherpas get it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're very human. <laughs> amazing, amazing people, but very human. Yeah. <laughs> so I continued up. You know, we didn't think much about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd soloed lots of mountains. Um, you know, got to, got to the summit at, when the sun was rising. It was just one of those, those moments, um, not only to just summit Everest like that in itself is just, it, it's something I'll process the rest of my life. I and, bet. and in that moment, it's like trying to, like, I know I'm here. I only have so much time. Mm -hmm. I'm like trying to like process it. I'm like, I'm here. And you just, you can't. It's just, it's too yeah. overwhelming. I bet. And then to be up there completely solo mm -hmm. is a whole other thing. So got a snack, got some water, took some selfies. And, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and made a radio call down. I uh, let everyone know I was up there. I was alone. I was mm -hmm. heading down. And how long can you spend up there? Like, what's your window? Um, an hour or less. Okay. Yeah. Got it. You can spend months getting up there and then it's you know, yeah. very small. Like your literal 15 window. minutes of fame. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so take lots of pictures because yeah. you'd be staring at them the rest of your life and yeah. reposting on Instagram. Um, so I start heading down and that's when everything went completely white. And what had happened is the day prior going up Lhotse Face, so you actually climb up the fourth highest mountain in the world, mm -hmm. Lhotse Face, it's just straight up for miles. Uh, my goggles had fallen and cracked. Got it. And I'd ripped out an internal lens. And Got it. Apparently, I cut their effectiveness in half. That and being up in the death zone. Yeah. As soon as the sun comes up, having blue eyes and more susceptible. Yeah. Fried my cornea. Went completely snow blind. Oh wow. And so now you're up there. You're totally by yourself, and you can't see anything. Can't see anything. And with yeah. snow blindness, it usually takes about 24 hours to come back. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't regain my eyesight for about a month and a half. Wow. So it was super severe. Um, Were they worried that there was going to be permanent damage, I'm assuming, at some point? Or Joanna was. Yeah. <laughs> a little later. <laughs> I, I, I had faith that I'd, I'd get my sight back. Um, but what if should, it should have taken me about three hours to get to high camp. It took me seven. Mm -hmm. So I ran out of oxygen and pretty much just hand over hand just made my way down. Was there a guide rope or, like, how did yeah. you figure out how to get back down then? Yeah, so – and. and on Everest and Himalayan peaks and even Denali and others, there's sections where you have fixed lines. So mm -hmm. It's ropes that are attached to anchor points. So me as a climber, I can go solo because I'm attached to the mountain, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem on Everest is it's just dreadlocks of rope from years past. They, oh. don't, they don't clean it up up higher. Oh, okay. So if you clip into the wrong one. You can end up in the wrong spot. Yeah, and it's a literal two-mile drop on each side of you when you're at the top. Oh, oh. <laughs> so... Small chance that you're not going to survive that. Yeah. But just had faith, just hand over hand, used my other senses. Yeah, like what's going through your head as you're going through this? Like are you are you praying? Are yeah. you talking to yourself? Or how are you getting yourself to yeah. move forward through yeah, this? Yeah, all of the above. So in the Navy, I mean, one, one thing I did, I was in oxygen-deprived situations. Mm -hmm. I was a rescue swimmer. I was underwater. I was rescuing people. Sure. And a lot of it comes down to never panicking. Mm -hmm. The person you're rescuing is panicking. They see you as flotation. They're trying to take you down. If you both panic, then you then, both die. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, a lot of that came back. Just don't panic. Just figure out how to take one more step mm -hmm. and use those senses. And I'm not normally blind. 
Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to use my eyes and it just, it hurts so bad. It's, it's super bright. It's like if you put a light bulb within an inch of your face, Mm -hmm. it's like that bright. You cannot focus. You could move your finger Uh and you'd know something just moved. You cannot focus. Mm -hmm. And then it feels like if you have like Doritos or something and broke them and put them in your eyelids. Oh gosh. (laughs) That's what it feels like. Yeah. How often your eyes actually move. Oh, sure. The whole time. It's super painful. Ouch. Um, But the whole time I'm going down, yeah, I just, I was just in prayer and just um, really felt a presence around me. And I didn't think too much about it, Mm -hmm. but it was just, it was there. It's like, if you close your eyes, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm here. Right. You may not think too much about it, but it's like, I feel something there. And yeah, the whole time just continued down, um, took a major fall, ran out of oxygen. And then at about the halfway point between the summit and high camp is when, you know, I'd been climbing like 33 hours continuous from that day prior, just completely wiped out Mm -hmm. and ran out of oxygen. And at that point, just um, dropped to my knees and just prayed, Mm -hmm. said, God, I can't do this alone. And just instantaneously just felt like someone like picked me up, just grabbed the back of my down suit, lifted me up. I just had this energy. Fumbled through a, an extra oxygen tank that I had that had previously failed, and it had a positive flow. And I remember just putting the you know the regulator on it and just feeling the air and just taking like five deep breaths and just the pain of the the life reentering my body. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just like burning through my veins. But wow, didn't overthink it. Just uh, put all my gear back on, started rappelling down like the last twenty pitches, trying not to trip over myself. Mm-hmm. And eventually made it into camp. Never saw a song coming. It came about a quarter mile across this ice field way up in the death zone there and just hugs me out of nowhere. Oh, like, oh. he's like, Brian, you alive? And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet they're worried about you. Yeah. Seriously. I remember Joanna posting, actually, when you were up there, like, uh, it's a little quiet. We need some prayers. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was that was powerful in itself. Just the power of prayer. Yeah. So many people reaching out and just, just mm-hmm. you know, just lifting me up when I really needed it. Mm hmm. That's amazing. Yep. So I, then I went to my tent, passed out for, I don't know, like 15 hours. I bet. <laughs> my eyes were glued shut. I lost 20 pounds, which I don't have. But No, you don't. <laughs> it was just, yeah, just totally beat up. And then I still had to get down. It's still two more days just to get down to um, base camp. And yeah. Another two to get to where I could fly home. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was pretty wrecked, but yeah. super pumped to be alive. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, woo <laughs> So many things I'll never complain about again. <laughs> yeah, it definitely gives you perspective for sure. Yeah. Did did they have medics up at that high camp? Like, did you get any medical attention or it was just you got to get yourself down and yeah. we'll figure it out from there? Yeah, I remember someone giving me like some ointment, like put this in your eyes. And I had someone else read it for me and it says, do not put in eyes. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> but I was, I was definitely, you know, I was just happy to be alive and just uh, a lot of tears. I think that helped. And then I got to to um, base camp, and there is a medical tent. Mm-hmm. It's like if you walk in the door, it's like a hundred bucks. Like uh-huh. that's how they make their money or whatever. But mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, I'm not paying. That. Oh, are you <laughs> Joanna, serious? I was able to talk to Joanna, and she's like, go and you know get in there. I'm like, I'm good. Oh, so, so then I like two more days out. And, really? Yep. And then flew to Bangkok, where I'd stay the night. And mm-hmm. That was the first time where like my right eye was started coming back a little bit. And yeah, how did you even navigate the travel? I mean, I'm assuming getting stuff. down, Pasang got you down, right? To With, a certain extent, and then another person helped me. Yeah, but now you, you're in, like, international airports. By myself, and too, stuff. yeah. So By yourself, just, and you can't really see anything. Yeah, it's super blurry, and it was Bangkok, so I'm a lot taller than the average person. Mm-hmm. So I'd just be walking down, poof, like, oh. <laughs> just bumping into people. I'm like, I'm sorry. And <laughs> That's rude American. I know, totally. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I just, I must have looked just horrible. Like, black yeah. eyes and just, like even more disgustingly skinny than I am right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So that that's a really cool story. Thanks. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. That is, yeah, that's so powerful for sure. And I'm sure you're an inspiration to everybody else. Did those other teams end up summiting Everest or no? Did they make it up? No. Um, I don't think so. I mean, some did, but yeah. some did not. Yeah. I'd imagine you were an inspiration to everybody on that mountain. During that whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I think people saw me and they're like, gosh. <laughs> Some people may have turned back. <laughs> but that's Looks okay. rough up there. <laughs> yeah. So that's really cool. Um, and such a powerful story about, like you said, really 
following your dreams and and making smart decisions because you have to do a lot of that on that mountain and do, doing yeah. all that for sure. Cool. And that's awesome. And you've come back. Have you done any big climbs since? Yeah. Yeah. I have been around the world climbing yeah. and yeah, even I later that. that year. So, I mean, I, I wasn't sure if I would again, you know, it was one of those things right. like, is this some sort of sign? You know, anyone who doesn't climb would be like, yeah, you're a moron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a wife and you know, children, so you've got to decide, okay, what's the right thing right. for the whole family? Yeah, right? but actually getting back on the mountain was the most therapeutic thing. I can, yeah, cause I bet. I went through a, a lot of PTSD, and even now, like, if I get on stage and I'm talking, I mean, there's, I, I've gotten better at it, and I've talked so many times, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's emotional. It's, it's a I bet. Thing. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time to be here today yeah, to course. share the story, because it really is amazing. Um, where did you climb after Everest? Um, locally, I did a few peaks here, uh -huh. um, but then went to Antarctica that later that year. Okay, climbed the highest peak down there. Cool. What's it, that like to climb in Antarctica? It was negative seventy on the top. Oh my so gosh! Cool is accurate. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little chilly. It's amazing though. Antarctica is like if you can ever go. You, you yeah, should. I've it, heard it's beautiful. Do you have to do the whole boat thing to get there, the Drake Passage, or can you, did you fly in? Um, or we flew in. in. So I was down in Chile. Uh huh. Punta Arenas, the southern tip of Chile, for like a week because weather was so bad. Mm -hmm. So I rented a car and went up to Patagonia and climbed like Torres del Paine. Just okay. Slept in the car. It was just like dirt bag in awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> it was so cool. <laughs> and just one of the coolest places. And mm -hmm. what's funny is it, it looks just like here, like in the North Cascades. But oh, does Because it? it's there, it's like, oh, it's cool. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> it's Patagonia. It's more exotic. But yeah, then we flew a, a Russian Aleutian air, airplane. And it's it's crazy because it's got like, you know, like, Anyone who goes to Antarctica is there for a purpose. Right. It's not like you just show up. Yeah. So you have scientists and you have climbers and you have people doing the South Pole and mm -hmm. um, National Geographic was there. I think it was for Discovery. Whoever did the Frozen Planet, mm -hmm. they were there. So we were like watching the raw footage like in the tents oh, and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, before it came out, it was cool. But yeah, it's it's amazing. But that, yeah, that airplane, it's five hours. You either land or you don't because you're landing right on the glacier and it's like... Oh, really? And if it's like bad conditions, they'll just take off and you're heading back to Chile. Really? But we landed and it's like all warm. We're hanging out cozy, you know, and they mm -hmm. open the door. You're like, oh. <laughs> like, I can't breathe. I can't blink. It is. <laughs> it's the biggest desert in the world. Yeah. And it's just ice desert. Yeah. How long did that take to do that climb? A um, couple weeks. Okay. Yeah. And how high is that? It's like just under 17,000. Okay. But because it's, it's kind of like Denali with the barometric pressure mm -hmm. because it's so low down the south pole right tack on like two to three thousand feet oh so got it it feels like that got it yeah but it's yeah it, it's awesome it's so cool that's very cool what a neat way to see a the world but different parts of the world too mm -hmm. um the south pole is definitely on my list in antarctica just because it's different mm -hmm. so very cool and you've brought that back you've kind of instilled it in your whole family right you guys go out and do a lot of hikes mm -hmm. and camps and stuff like that you said your son's really into the climbing and things as well yeah right? yeah emily's more into like well Go up to like Camp Mir or something on mm -hmm. Rainier, you know, and mm -hmm. their favorite thing each year is winter mountaineering. Oh, yeah. You always post cool pictures of that. Yeah, they, they love it. Do they? Yeah, and Joanna's like, oh, you. Does like, she go or no? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> She'll pack your lunch and. I'll yeah, go. <laughs> and then that's, you know, you got a weekend, you do this. Like mm -hmm. anytime she has, like, if she's traveling or anything, I'm just like, oh, adventure. Uh huh. You know, like this year, um, Emily and she went to DC for the eighth grade trip. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, what can we do? So Jordan and I went and climbed, climbed uh, Mount Whitney. Okay. Down in the Sierras. That's awesome. So it's like an adventure. Let's yeah, out. I think that's such a cool thing to do with your kids. A, to teach them about that because you're right. I think we are way too screen obsessed in our world. Um, so to give your kids that experience I think is just cool. And then I'm always about time, right? You know, especially with your kids. Mm -hmm. It's the whole quality versus quantity i think it's really more about the quantity the quant the quality comes from the quantity mm -hmm. you can't get quality time with your kids of like okay i got 15 minutes tell me how your school day was mm -hmm. right you just you need to do something where there's limited distractions and you just are just spending time together right and that's when cool stuff happens and you're probably reaching that point where we are we're just to imagine them like being in college and not yes. in the house like how depressing is that going to be oh i'm freaking out yeah in fact even well alex is 14 so he has a really a, almost a solid two years before he can drive because he's a young 14. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody's saying, oh, you'll love it when they can drive themselves around. And yeah, logistically, it'll be nice. But anymore, that's kind of the time you get with him, right, right. is driving him to different mm -hmm. things. So 
you know, I, I'm sure it'll be nice and I'll be posting something on Facebook about, woohoo, look at what I'm doing with all my free time. But I actually think I'm going to miss it too because yeah, that's see. our time together, right? So it's it's not even the full four years left of high school. It's really like two, two and a half and then yeah. off doing other things. Yeah, interesting. I didn't think of that. I was oh, thinking the actual yeah. four. Now I'm super depressed. Oh, sorry. Glad Appreciate I that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other option is that they just don't get a car. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't let them get their license, which, you know, we may go that way. Yeah. <laughs> what, do you have your winter camp planned for this year? Where are you guys going this year? Um, no. Last year we were up on Rainier. Mm -hmm. um, the year before we went just out east and just kind of found – it's crazy because, like, there's a lot of snowmobilers oh, sure. out east and didn't realize that. We're spending half the day and, you know, it gets dark at, like, you know, noon. Mm -hmm. So – <laughs> we're trying to figure out spots, and then, then it's like, you know what? Let's just hike this way forever, and we'll figure it out. Yeah. And that's part of the adventure, too. Yeah. Just out there cruising and get, like, two tents, a cooking tent or our sleeping tent. Right. And it's, like, zero degrees, and, you know, they're just – they're loving it. They come home. and I bet. You know, I bet Joanna's they have some cool like, stories. Yeah. It's like, was it freezing? Yeah, but we loved it. <laughs> <laughs> She's cool. like, well, I stayed here with the fire, and yeah. good for you guys. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here today, Brian, and for sharing your story. Yeah. Um, it's pretty powerful. I'm going to make the kids listen to this with all of your goal-setting stuff. Okay. I think you're going to mention the kids, whether you know it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the book is Blind Descent. Uh, Brian Dickinson is here with us today, and uh, we'll have all of this on uh, the website after the show because it uh, it's a fantastic read. It's such a powerful story. Um, Brian's a great storyteller. He... Uh, He's got some really good stuff in here. We'll have it on the website, NicoleMangina.com forward slash podcast. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye. The views expressed on this program are those of the host, guest, and callers, 